So you want to be a picture book writer, then you got to write picture books. And you're going to need a bucket load of bright ideas for titles, plots, and hooks. If you're partial to prose or you're raring to rhyme, then repeat after me. It's a challenge, but I'm going to tackle each story one month at a time with 12 by 12. What is the difference between a ban and a challenge? You'll see some people will use the words interchangeably, but there is a pretty distinct difference between the two. A challenge is usually what comes first. This is where an individual or a group or an organization walks into a school or a library and says, hey, I don't like ABC book. I don't think that it should be on the shelf. That would be a challenge. The ALA tracks these and member organizations, which is basically all libraries that are part of the ALA, then can report those to the ALA to keep track of. What we know is that about 90% of bans and challenges never get reported. So all we have data on is only about 10% of the bans and challenges that happen in our country any given year. A ban is when a person or organization comes into the library and says, ABC book shouldn't be on the shelf. And that library, school, whatever says, Okay, and they then take it off the shelf and it is no longer available. There is something of a middle ground where a library may say, okay, we'll take it off the shelf, but we'll keep it in circulation. So if somebody asks for it specifically, they can have it, but it won't be presented publicly. You may have libraries that reshelf a book. If somebody comes in and says, I don't think this is appropriate for children, they may then move it to the adult section of the library. There's a lot of kind of gray areas in between that where they may end up making a decision. And then there's also the best outcome, which is where the library says, cool, don't read the book then, but everybody else is welcome to. And that's my favorite outcome when we have those. When we're looking at the numbers, when we look at 2019, which is the last kind of normal year of data that we have, there was 377 challenges of 566 books across the country throughout the year of 2019. And again, this is only about 10% of what actually happened in the country. So you can extrapolate those numbers and tell this is a huge thing. In 2020, a lot of schools and a lot of libraries were closed. So we saw a dramatic decrease in the number of challenges. There was only air quotes, only 156 challenges of 273 books in 2020. And then when you look at 2021, this is where things start to get really off the rails. We had 729 challenges of 1,597 books. That is a huge increase. It's more than double from our last like normal year of 2019. And again, this is at best 10% of what was actually happening on the ground in 2021. You can see here in this graphic that the most common initiator of a challenge is a kind of parents or patrons of the library. You will occasionally see them coming from inside the house, which is especially terrifying in my opinion. We recently had a situation like this here in Michigan where a trustee of the board was proposing a new materials handling policy that basically said no books that had anything LGBTQIA+, nothing political, nothing harmful would be allowed for the kids area. And those are those ones are especially terrifying to me as somebody who is a trustee of a library. And occasionally they do come from librarians and teachers, which again is also very terrifying. Elected officials are the ones who get a lot of attention, but they are one of the smaller ones. And then a very tiny number of students will initiate a ban or a challenge. What are the common reasons and language that people use for challenges? Often, if you look at the top 10 lists by year, you will see a trend of what was happening in the wider world when these books were being banned or challenged. Very common reasons people will give for a book being banned or challenged is it's too sexually explicit, which is usually a code that they're using for something that includes LGBTQIA plus content. In 2020, for the first time ever, QIA plus books were not the most common reason for being in the top 10. Racism, CRT related content were in the top 10 most often. And then back in 20 or coming back to 2021, we have rolled back to the go-to of sexually explicit LGBTQIA plus content as the reason why people are challenging or banning books. You will see very similar language that is used by people when they are banning or challenging books. And that's for a very good reason because they're all reading from the same script. What we have found in 2021 and in 2020 is groups, you will find them in every community, in every state, red state, blue state, populous, very high population states, low population. It is everywhere and it is consistent. And they are using the same language because different political action groups have put together lists and then they are dispersing them and they are working with local parent groups to build outrage when it comes to things like banned books. 
which is why they're all using the same books. If you go to like school board meetings or library board meetings, they're all reading from the same passages. They're all saying the same things. It's because they're all following the same script. They're very well organized. It's really frustrating. One thing that we have found personally in our school district that has really helped is having a solid policy and plan for what to do if somebody bans a child abuse support. A lot of schools are getting caught off center because of budget cuts. Lots of schools don't have dedicated media staff anymore. They don't have a librarian who's trained in understanding First Amendment rights and book challenges. They don't have policies in place for what do you do if somebody's trying to ban or challenge a book. Our school is very lucky. We have a fantastic media staff and a trained librarian who has a policy in place. And the very first line of the policy is if you would like to ban or challenge a book, you have to read the book in its entirety. And then you have to write basically a book report of exactly what it is that you are objecting to and why this book should not be allowed for people to read. Because of her policy, I honestly believe, we had zero challenges in my community. Now, that's not to say that they haven't been showing up to our school board meetings and having dramatic readings. They have definitely been doing that, but they have never actually challenged a book in our school library. And that's such an important thing, and I'll talk about this more later when we're talking about what can we do to fight this, but huge importance is making sure that your school, your public library, that they have a policy in place and that they understand what they're going to do when they face this challenge if they haven't already. So I've talked about this a little. Where do challenges happen? Obviously, the most common place that we see them is in school libraries, at school board meetings. These are some of our biggest ones that we've seen in the news lately. When you think about Tennessee School Board deciding that mouse was inappropriate and they were banning it from the curriculum. When you look at challenges in places like Florida and in Texas, these are very often happening in schools, at school board meetings, at school libraries. And the next most common place is public library. We deal with this at the public library that I am a board member of. Every public library probably has dealt with this recently. And then schools and other academics, colleges, things like that also deal with challenges. So what can you do? This is really the meat and most important thing that I'm going to talk about. There is so much as individuals, as authors, if you're a parent, if you're a community member, we all can be doing something about bans and challenges. And the first one is showing up. First of all, showing up to this and learning more about it is huge. Getting the language and the knowledge to be able to talk about this with other people, so very important. But showing up to school board meetings, showing up to county commissioner meetings, to city council meetings, to library meetings, these are places where these bans or challenges are happening on the ground every day. And a lot of the times they're happening because nobody's paying attention. I am one of those people who goes to my city council meeting and obviously I go to my library meeting since I'm on the board. I go to our school board meetings and until something as dramatic is happening, nobody's there. And usually by the time the dramatic thing is happening, it's too late. So please, if you have the ability, show up to your meetings, be aware of what's happening, speak up in defense of books. I speak very regularly and I will say this, if you're nervous about public speaking, Having spent the last year and a half going to two school board meetings a month, the word salads, I have heard people say into the microphone, you will be great. No matter what you say, if you are speaking from the heart and speaking genuinely, you will sound like the most intelligent person ever. So do not be afraid to make use of your voice. Speak up about books. Be very real about what books mean to you. For me personally, I'm very passionate about the fact that Books save lives. I grew up as a kid in the 90s who had no idea what bisexual was. I thought that I was just a freak because I knew that I was attracted to the boys in my class, but I was also attracted to the girls in my class. And I was like, I know what gay is. I know what straight is. What's wrong with me? Why am I not like that? If I had the language and the understanding of what bisexual was sooner, I would have saved myself a lot of confusion. And I got off very lucky for kids who are trans, for kids who are non-binary, for kids who are dealing with things that their peers don't understand. Books can be a thing that shows them that they're not alone. It can be a thing that shows them there are other people out in the world who have experienced what you've experienced and gotten through that. You can get through it too. Like the power of books is undeniable. So speak up about that. Talk about the, book, the differences that books have made in your life and why it's so important for all kids to have access to these. Because even if a child is cis, het, white, middle-class, never struggled, giving them the ability to read books of people who've had different lived experiences only creates empathy and only creates good things for them. And that is something that is so very important and vital that books can do. So speak up, 
say that, talk about that. Don't let the only people who are screaming about books be the ones who are trying to say that books are dangerous. If you have the ability, donate to organizations like the American Library Association, the ACLU, any First Amendment rights organization, they are doing hard work right now. And lastly, vote. Voting is so important. And I am a particularly a proponent. You need to be voting at your local elections. Because like I've said earlier, these are not happening generally at the state level. These are happening at the local school district level, the local city level. And these are people that we vote for in very small numbers. So you need to make sure that you are aware of who's running for these positions and you are voting for them. some of the things to keep an eye on nationally right now. Obviously, we've seen some big, the Tennessee ban of mouse. We've seen some bans in Texas where a state senator had a list of, I think it was 300 and some books that he sent out to every school district asking if they could account for whether or not they had these books that he doesn't want them to have. Luckily, most of the school districts rightly ignored him. And the one that's really particularly important is one that we're watching right now in Virginia. So when I talk about banned books, very often, the first thing that people will say to me is, what's the big deal? This is Luna, by the way. What's the big deal about banning books from libraries? You can still just go buy it ignoring all of the privilege that it takes to be able to purchase books. There is a challenge happening right now in, right now in Virginia, where we are seeing a law that was written in the 1970s that is little known, has been a little used, being brought up to the forefront right now. A Virginia delegate and a man who was running for Congress decided to use this law, which is Virginia Code 18.2-384, which states a anybody in the state of Virginia can bring forward a book and ask that a judge deems that book obscene for any reason at any time. If that judge agrees and deems that book obscene, nobody in the state of Virginia can produce, possess, or sell that book. Yep, no one. And so they sued Barnes and Noble because they had to pick a retailer to sue. They decided to sue Barnes and Noble in Virginia Beach for selling Gender Queer, which is the number one most banned or challenged book of 2021, and A Court of Mist and Fury, which is the second book in the Sarah J. Moss Court of Thorns and Roses books. To say that they were obscene, they asked that they ban them for anybody under the age of 18, but the judge is the only one who gets to decide that. And that trial is still processing. The judge said that they had probable cause and they are asking for more information. So right now it is in the courts, the publishers, the authors are all getting information to the judge to basically prove that these are not obscene because they are not, but we're still just waiting. We have to wait and see what happens. And this is especially terrifying right now with everything that is happening with the Supreme Court. One of the precedents that has been tagged in their decision for reversing Roe v. Wade actually has nothing to do with abortion and has everything to do with your ability to own obscene material. So what they're stating is that you have no right to privacy, thus no right to own obscene material if a state decides that it's obscene and that you can't have it. So we're all a little nervous right now. We're all a little worried. Luckily, there are some amazing organizations like the ALA that are on it and are doing wonderful work. So please support them if you have the ability to. And then as authors, the thing that you all can do that the rest of us cannot do is to continue to write amazing books that feature diverse communities, your lived experiences, that feature these topics that are important for kids to understand and to have access to and to use your voice to do that because these books make a difference and these books change lives and they save lives and it's such an important thing that you are able to do. So please continue to write these amazing books and to fight for your rights and to know that this does affect authors and writers in a huge way. We see that with publishers, If they are books that are being challenged consistently, like we're seeing with books that have BIPOC representation, queer representation, authors are seeing that publishers are less willing to take a chance on books that contain that information. Because if a a publisher is going to have to deal with expensive lawsuits in the state of Virginia to say that their books aren't obscene, they're generally going to focus more towards the business decision of, that's not a great investment for us, let's stick with what's safe. So we need to be advocating with publishers to continue to publish these important stories, authors to continue to write these stories, schools and libraries to continue to support these stories. Often when we hear about banned books, people assume that if you are a banned book, you end up on the bestsellers list. Yeah, that happens. Usually it's for those very few cases, the top 10, the big ones that we hear about in the news. But for a lot of authors, it means 
you're not getting invited to schools to talk about your book. Your books aren't getting purchased by school libraries, which are a huge source of income for especially kids' book authors. And this is something that's very real, very tangible, and is hurting authors' bottom lines. So as authors, use your voice, use your platform, keep writing amazing books, keep pushing, and keep explaining why these are so important. Do it together so never you fear. It's a handy little way to help you kick into gear. You're amazing, exciting. Look out! Cause you're writing 12 by 12, 12 manuscripts 12 by 12, 12 picture books 12 by 12